So, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, please take your seat. We have today a very strict time schedule. Of course, first of all, I would like to welcome the Commissioner-designate for Trade, Mr. Phil Hogan, sitting here in front of me. Welcome, Phil. I think the purpose of this meeting is evident, so I have not to explain it. Mr. Hogan responds to our five written questions. They have been distributed in all languages and published on the Parliament's website. And I would like also to inform you that the Committee on Legal Affairs has raised no objection to hold this hearing today. So we can proceed. And yes, uh, Mr. Hogan, once again, welcome to the Committee. The democratic heart of uh, trade policy, of course, is a great honor for me to chair this wonderful committee. Just like trade policy itself, it has really involved uh, tremendously in, over the last years. Now, this committee is the committee saying yes or no to trade agreements and also involved in trade-related legislations. So, it is really the democratic power of the people in Europe on trade policy. And yes, we are living in challenging times. Our relationship with our key bilateral partners are strained for different reasons. WTO is in crisis. Brexit possibly will come quite soon. And perhaps just in these days we will have another custom coming from the United States based on the Boeing ruling of WTO. Fortunately, the EU has managed to uh, establish quite successfully good bilateral trade agreements and, of course, good legislation to stabilizing the um, uh, rule-based trading system. And, of course, the European Parliament has played an important role in improving trade agreements like we did it in CETA or in legislation like we did it in the conflict minerals legislation. And yes, trade is more under public awareness. Our people on the ground wanted to know who is benefiting from trade. Is trade weakening our consumer protection? And what is the contribution of trade to the Paris Climate Agreement. So a lot of challenge and threats. However, we should face this challenge and threats and take trade policy serious, perhaps firmly anchored in some principles. Sustainability should be one of the principles. Trade is an effective tool to set fair standards for goods and, of course, also for the production process of goods and services, and the ILO conventions are playing an important role. Secondly, implementation and enforcement. For me, it's totally clear it's time to move from words to facts. The broad network of trade agreements that we are currently have should deliver inside and outside the EU, and we need the adequate instruments for that. Third, coherence. Trade policy should be coherent with other policies in the European Union and on national levels. For example, it makes no sense to argue for a reduction of subsidies in the fisheries sector and at the same time trying to subsidize new vessels inside the European Union. So we have to be coherent in our 
policy and um, also false trace policy has really reflected democratic scrutiny. And Ursula von der Leyen has stated in her political guidelines that there should be a specific and special partnership between the Commission and the European Parliament. And Mr. Hogan, after reading your written answers, you are really underlining these positions. But I'd like to raise four points where the Parliament should get a little bit more clarity. First, I'm convinced that the European Parliament is, has to be seen as an institutional actor, specifically after the development of the last 10 years, and it not, should not be put in the same basket as normal stakeholders. It is in answers question uh, three and, and, and seven. Secondly, while the commitment to share scoping papers would be a welcome improvement compared to the current situation, but uh, Mr. Hogan, perhaps it's not enough. Uh, it's well known that uh, scoping papers were discussed with member states and uh, it's totally clear that the important work is um, doing before fixing a scoping paper, the why and what, and the negotiations are concluded with a scoping paper. So the Parliament asked to be involved before finishing scoping paper. Certainly, at the same time, I would have to, uh, uh, want to, uh, like to have more um, engagement uh, in the question of provisional application. Ursula von der Leyen said that the Commission should always propose a provisional application for trade agreements only after EP has given consent. Your answer were not so clear. Please uh, come back to that and uh, make, I think, clear that uh, the democratic right of the Parliament should be respected in the question of provisional application. And fourthly, uh, the scrutiny and competence for the EP should be possible in the implementation of ex existing agreements. We as committee here are quite clear that uh, joint committees, councils, or other organizations in the implementation process of agreements should be not black boxes, they should be also under democratic scrutiny. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a really defining moment of parliamentary scrutiny. It's a defining moment of democracy in the EU, in the EU trading, trade policy. And of course, I will invite my colleagues to make the voice and uh, engage with clear um, questions is a clear aim of getting concrete commitments from you, the new commissioner. Then this is more than a grilling exercise. This should be also a key point of defining our common strategy for trade policy in the next five years. So let me go to the practicalities of this exercise. First of all, the structure of this hearing. It has to follow the rules of procedure of the Parliament, no doubt about, and it should be given a fair and equal opportunity to all commissioners designated to present themselves and their opinions. So, to start up, Phil Hogan has um, the possibility to give an opening statement for 15 minutes. And then, according to our rules of procedure, there will be time for 25 questions from the members. In the first block, we will have the questions from the seven coordinators of the political groups in inter. And in the second round, we will have questions from 18 members, according to the quotas for the different, different political groups and also including a representative of the non-attached member. And I welcome in this uh, moment the chair of the AFID committee, David McAllister. He will ask a question 
among the other 18 members. The question and the answers will be happen in a five-minute time slot. So each member has one minute for asking his or her question. Then Phil Hogan has the chance to give a two-minute answers. And then, if needed, there's a possibility for the same member to ask a follow-up question of maximum one minute. And the Commissioner-designate has the possibility to answer this follow-up question also in one minute. But it's clear, the rules of procedures are clear, this follow-up question must relate to the Commissioner-designate's reply to the first question and should not be used to waste other matters. And therefore, I reserve me the right to disallow a follow-up question if this do not meet this criteria. And um, this is um, um, the structure, of course, at the end of uh, the questions, the Commissioner-designate will have all uh, uh, another five minutes to make a closing um, statement. As I mentioned, this hearing is strictly limited to three hours, and the time for asking questions is also strictly limited, and I will strongly enforce the speaking time limits. The interpretation is provided in 23 languages, and of course, especially at this hearing, the Irish proposal for a commissioner uh, is uh, here, uh, and of course, we have also some Irish members, they can also speak in Gaelic. All members can speak in their own language, but all only in the proposed time limit. And uh, of course, due to the fact that we have 23 um, languages and interpretation, please speak clear, not too quick, so that it can be interpreted and it can be also recognized on the screen because this meeting, of course, as usual in our intercommittee, is web streamed live on this Parliament website, and um, it's also video recorded. That is the introduction of the structure of this hearing, and now I will invite the Commissioner-designate for Trade, Phil Hogan, to give his opening remarks. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, uh, honorable members. I am very grateful to President-elect uh, von der Leyen for nominee, nominating me as Commissioner-designate for Trade. And I hope at the end of this hearing that you will feel able to place your trust in me to fulfill this role. I am no stranger to international trade because as Commissioner for Agriculture and Rural Development, I have been working closely with the outgoing Commissioner Cecilia Malmström. Her legacy is a very positive one, which I hope to build upon. And I have experienced firsthand how interna international trade is the lifeblood of the European Union economy, with exports of goods and services supporting one in seven jobs. So I believe that the European Union's trade policy can and must provide real opportunities for sustainable growth, for stability and predictability in an increasingly volatile world, while offering EU businesses a level playing field and the protection from unfair trading practices. But trade policy must also be able to evolve. We need to show that it is relevant and fit, for, and fit for purpose to address the new challenges to our security, our strategic autonomy, and our technological leadership. And it must also reflect and promote our values in the European Union and what we stand for, especially in areas like climate action, sustainable development, labour rights, standards and women's empowerment. And before highlighting my priorities, let me reassure you that if I am confirmed, I will continue to build 
on the transparent way in which trade policy has been made during the period of the last Parliament. I will be a regular visitor to this committee and in the plenary to respond to your issues of interest. I will also ensure that you have timely access to all the information you need, and I note very carefully what you have suggested, Mr. Chairman. I will be supportive in encouraging the Council to listen to your views in making progress on legislative files and in avoiding provisional application of trade agreements before you have had the chance to give your consent. And I will work with you to project, explain and promote our trade policy to people across Europe and beyond. Accurate and professional communication of our trade relationships is important. So I want to turn now to the five main priorities for trade policy in this mandate. Firstly, we must support a stable, predictable and rules-based trading environment by strengthening the World Trade Organization. Secondly, we must manage our relationships and continue to build partnerships through trade around the world, with a particular focus on our direct neighbourhood and on Africa. Thirdly, we must open markets and make trade a reality for EU businesses of all sizes. This also means that existing agreements should be fully implemented and better enforced. Fourthly, we must ensure that we have the tools to enable fair and open trade and a level playing field both internally and externally. And fifthly, we must ensure that trade is sustainable, promoting the European Union's values and focusing on climate action in line with the priorities of the Income Commission and the concerns of this Parliament. So I want to take each of those five in turn. Trade cannot fulfil its potential without the stability and predictability that comes from a rules-based multilateralism. In President Elect's words, multilateralism is in Europe's DNA. It is our guiding principle in the world. My Commission will keep on championing this approach and ensure that we uphold and update the rules-based global order. So the international rules-based trading order with the World Trade Organization at its core is facing its biggest challenge to date. The WTO is essential, but it needs to be updated. It offers a route to resolve trade disputes based on rules rather than the law of the jungle. This is why we need to uphold and defend it, but also to ensure that its rules are fit to address the issues of today. The European Union has already played a leading role with this Parliament's support in trying to address this difficult environment. And if confirmed, I will therefore do my utmost to prevent the collapse of the WTO dispute settlement mechanism and find a systemic solution to reform the app appellate body. At the same time, I'll work hard with other T WTO members to reinvigorate the negotiating function of this organisation. We should focus first on concluding negotiations on fishery subsidies as mandated by Sustainable Development Goal 14.6, Domestic regulation in services and investment facilitation will require an extra push in view of next summer's 12th MC11 conference in Kazakhstan. I am also keen to work with others to advance the e-commerce negotiations, to prepare an initiative in the second half of 2020 to build a new way forward for the WTO. The rule book needs to be updated to address issues such as the rampant use of subsidies by China and others and forced technology transfers. In the current international context, too many of our partners are on the path towards protectionism. Europe needs to speak up for fair, open and rules-based trade. If confirmed as trade commissioner, our partners can expect a counterpart who is willing to show leadership, work constructively and strive for positive outcomes. But I'll also be strong in standing up for European Union interests and, the value, and our values when needed. Transatlantic partnership has shaped international relations and the global order for the past 70 years. The United States has played a long-standing role as an essential supporter of the open global trade system. But some of the concerns of the United States about the global trading system are ones that we share, though we firmly believe that changes are best achieved within rules. So the European Union will continue to move forward on areas of common interest and work with and work to reduce trade tensions, for example those areas that can be agreed and implemented as happened in July 2018 between President Juncker and President Trump. Or we can work trilaterally together with Japan 
to develop common approaches on aspects of WTO reform. I am committed to work on a positive transatlantic agenda, and I will be open to the rapid resolution of trade disputes with my U US counterpart. We achieved this this year on the hormone-free beef quota, but to reach our objective, we need to have willing partners. The relationship between security, technology, and trade is evolving very rapidly. It's affecting our relationships with all major players, and we are ready to engage with the United States on these issues, in particular the security aspects of investment and export controls. We share a common understanding on the challenges posed by China's use of subsidies and the heavy involvement of the state in its economy. It stands to reason that we should find grounds to cooperate with our transatlantic allies and Japan on such strategic questions. But our relationship with China is also important and vital. It remains a source of wealth and jobs on both sides. Our companies need to be able to compete with, Jap with Chinese companies though on a level playing field, both in China and within the European Union. This is not the case today. I will pursue active dialogue and engagement, including in areas of common interest, such as climate change, environmental protection, the reform of the WTO, including discipline and industrial subsidies. I will also prioritize our ongoing investment negotiations with the objective of rebalancing our investment relationship with China. We have to stand firm in defending our interests and values, and I'm well aware of the concerns of this Parliament in this regard. Our approach to China should entail rebalancing our trade relationship and addressing unfair trading practices. I will not shy away from using our trade defence instruments to this end, and our relations should be based on effective reciprocity in access to markets and opportunities for businesses and investors. We also need to strengthen the security of our critical infrastructure and our technological base, as outlined in the March 2019 communication on China. We have enhanced our internal toolbox with measures such as the EU mechanism on investment screening, and we're working on how to address the distortive effects of foreign trade ownership or foreign state ownership and foreign subsidies in the internal market. We must also ensure that agreements reached with our eastern neighbours are delivering their full promise while continuing to develop our ambition for deep and comprehensive free trade areas with our southern Mediterranean partners. We will follow developments with the European economic area countries like Switzerland and Turkey. Of course, no consideration of the neighbourhood would be complete without reference to Brexit. The United Kingdom is scheduled to leave the European Union 31 days from today. While it remains impossible to predict the final outcome, and many people feel obliged to predict the outcome, the Commission has prepared exhaustively for a no-deal Brexit. Africa must become even a greater priority for us as well. The recently agreed African-European alliance, based on a policy and investment partnership of equals, points the way forward. I will build on my own experience in creating the Task Force for Rural Africa as Commissioner for Agriculture and Rural Development, which puts together African policy leadership and EU support and investment together to help implement key actions. Our trade agreements with Canada, Japan, Vietnam, and most recently with Mercosur demonstrate our ability to leverage our internal market to open markets abroad, to spread our regulations and standards, and to help improve social and environmental policies and practices in third countries. We will continue our ongoing negotiations with Australia and New Zealand and pursue new par partnerships if the conditions are right. But we also need to, to do a better job in ensuring that the full potential of our existing agreements is realised. Our trading partners must respect the commitments they have made in all chapters. I believe, therefore, it's essential that we step up our efforts to implement and enforce existing agreements. The appointment of a Chief Trade Enforcement Officer will create a focal point for this work, and I will ask him or her to work closely with you in taking our enforcement agenda forward. I also share your concern that we should do more for small and medium-sized enterprises. Over 80% of EU businesses involved in international trade are small and medium-sized enterprises, for which trade and investment barriers present particular challenges for them. Fostering fair and open trade will be a priority. We must stand up against protectionism where it occurs. We must promote reciprocal trading conditions and fair competition by levelling the playing field both internally and externally. For example, using instruments such as the International Procurement Initiative, which aims to create reciprocity, enabling the European Union businesses to succeed in government procurement of markets abroad. 
We must also tackle unfair competition by addressing more forcibly foreign subsidies which affect EU companies and by making full use of existing tools, for example, in trade defence. This also means strengthening our own toolbox, including rules that allow us to react to illegal discriminatory trade measures by third countries where a course under the WTO is not available. Trade must not only be fair and open, but also sustainable. Trade policy must contribute to addressing global challenges, such as climate change, protecting the environment, and strengthening our labour standards. This is why the sustainable development chapters in each of our agreements, with their binding commitments on labour and the environment, are so important. To pursue these goals, I will be ready to make full use of the different instruments at our disposal, through trade preferences, through bilateral trade agreements, through action at multilateral level, for example, on opening markets for environmental goods and services to help meet our international climate and environment commitments. If confirmed, I also intend to work with you to renew our generalised system of preferences, which offers preferential access to exports from developing and least developing countries. Its reform should ensure that it remains the most generous scheme of its kind in the world, while incentivising our partners to move towards sustainable growth and development policies. The deeper focus on climate and sustainability in the incoming Commission reflects our citizens' expectations. Therefore, these values must be firmly built into our trade agenda. Mr Chairman and Members, trade policy is one of the most dynamic areas of EU action. We have a full and important agenda at a critical moment for multilateralism and for a fragile global trading system. This Parliament, and in particular this Committee, has since the Lisbon Treaty become a decisive player in shaping that trade agenda. And I am committed to working closely with you to reinforce that partnership. Europe needs to be the global champion of fair, sustainable and rules-based trade. With your help, I believe we can strengthen that leadership role. We can act and deliver results that show the European Union at its best. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mr. Hogan. And now we have the first round for question from the coordinators of the political groups. And the first from the EPP is Christoph Hansen. Chairman, and welcome to uh, our inter-hearing here, uh, Commissioner um, Phil Hogan, uh, Commissioner and Commissioner-designate, by the way. Uh, as you know, the EU and the US uh, are the most deeply integrated economic uh, regions in the world. The transatlantic partnership supports 16 million jobs on both sides of the Atlantic and represents one-third of global GDP. Yet, the policy of the current US administration is jeopardizing the stabi stability with unilateral tariff awards and by paralyzing the WTO, the capstone of the international trade order. So my question to you would be, how are you going to reset the transatlantic relationship and how will the EU stand up for rules-based global trade in the face of a president who is manipulating and uh, the interdependence that has underpinned stability in the global trade nexus for so long? Thank you. Thanks a lot. Mr. Hogan. Well, I suppose uh, during the moments of heightened tension, uh, we must not lose sight of the big picture. We trade 3 billion euros a day with the United States. And the EU-US relationship remains the largest and deepest economic relationship in the world. We already have a foundation for re-engagement. It was the successful meeting of President Juncker and President Trump in July 2018. But unfortunately, we have not seen much movement on that agenda since then. So President-elect von der Leyen has a clear objective, which he has asked me to engage in, is to build on this positive agenda of 2018 and to try my best politically to persuade the United States to work towards a positive, a balanced and a more mutually beneficial partnership with the United States. But of course, it takes two to tango. And I'm ready to engage politically with the United States to resolve our trade differences. In fact, I, I, I wonder why it has taken so long for them uh, to do so. But I will do so in a fair manner, a manner while standing up for the uh, interest of the European Union. The key is to relentlessly focus, I believe, on the mutual beneficial dimension. And the recent conclusion of a deal that I've just mentioned on beef uh, last July is a clear example of the European Union's willingness to resolve an issue that has been going on for a while, but to do so through dialogue and cooperation. The relationship between security, technology and trade is evolving, so we need the United States at the WTO to fully engage in these issues. 
we need him to understand that we share many of the issues that have concerned the United States from the point of view of state-owned subsidies from one particular country in, uh, that we all know about and the way that they are in, uh, share, using their state-owned control in order to drive the agenda in a closed market situation. So it stands to reason that we should have fine common ground to cooperate if this is the objective of trying to deal with these issues, but to do so in the, under the umbrella of the WTO. So I think that using the, the mutual beneficial role and that approach to, to, can lead to various agreements benefiting both sides, and I hope that the United States will see it that way. Follow up. Yes, please, a follow-up question. So uh, as we are speaking, uh, either today or tomorrow, uh, tomorrow we expect the WTO ruling on the, um, on, on the Airbus case. Uh, so um, we have seen a provisional list of the, um, of, of the sectors that will be focused by the US, uh, namely uh, wine, olives, uh, cheese, etc. So they are focusing or uh, targeting the member states uh, they, uh, where there are pro um, suppliers of, uh, of Airbus. So um, I feel that there is uh, a, a will behind to break the unity amongst the member states. Do you see that as well? Or, and how can we avoid this? And especially because it's uh, agricultural products that are targeted, how can we protect in this uh, frame the agricultural uh, sector? Mr. O. Well, I have, the, the Commissioner Malmström has put forward a possible solution to dealing with the Airbus case in the WTO and to ensure that Airbus com comes into full compliance. As you know, there is another case in the WTO that affects the United States of America, which is Boeing, which the decision on this will be made in some months' time. So it doesn't make sense that when we have, as the European Union, put forward constructive solutions to the problem that's before us, uh, that the United States would uh, retaliate in some particular way seeing that they're going to have the, to deal with the issue of it if it goes badly wrong for them on Boeing. So we have uh, tried to engage with the United States on this, but today we have not found them in a position to do so. But I understand perfectly well the difficulty for commodities that are on the list, but let's see what the extent of the, of the uh, decision will be in terms of the United States in the form of, ret of retaliation. Uh, what's on the list, and then we will have to evaluate it. But Europe has to stand up for itself as well in terms of the products that we will identify in return. Thanks a lot. For the Socialists and Democrats, it's Kathleen van Bremt. Thank you, Chair. This is sabotage. <laughs> Okay, so it's working. Well. Take another one. Now I'm even further away, Commissioner, but that's, that has no symbol. Um, welcome, Commissioner and com Commissioner-designate. Um, I have very, two very specific questions to you with regard to the FTAs. The first is on the TSD chapters. And, and let us agree on the fact that the current approach on upholding the TSD standards is today not working. You only have to look at South Korea, we know the case, or Colombia, for instance, where the last year 100 and 69 um, unionists and human rights defenders were killed. Um, and you said in your written answers, make use of all tools available in order to pursue sustainable and climate objectives. And my first question is, how would you elaborate, how would you do that when you look at the implementation of the TSD chapters today? The last commission launched a plan with four, 15 uh, specific action plans. And which of these actions you think they are not good enough, they should be strengthened, or do you plan new actions on the TSD chapter? I have a sec second question, and it, that is on um, the pre-ratification. I have um, to when be look really to strong. You have a follow-up possibility. Okay. Mr. Holm. Thank you very, thank you very much, uh, Madam Van Brent. 
I'm very familiar with the many of the coordinators that I've met and members of this committee and that you have certainly a desire to do better in terms of enforcement and implementation of our existing agreements and to use trade policy very effectively for that purpose. The Korean example is the first time that in a, an agreement that we actually have utilized all of the various uh, dispute settlement and actions at our disposal to try and bring Korea into line with a chapter that they were not in, in compliance with. So I think this is, a, this is a good opportunity to test for the first time the enforcement and implementation and to see has a partner of ours actually fulfilled what they said they would do in signing up to an agreement. And I would say we should build on this. Now the 15 point action plan on the sustainability agenda, the TSD chapter, is very important to me. It requires greater involvement of civil society, greater involvement of the institutional arrangements that we have here within, within the European institutions as well. It means opening up further opportunities to ensure that we implement through supporting financially as well complaints that can be made uh, and to be able to provide the evidence uh, that's necessary in order to meet a case. So I very much strongly support the use of trade and trade instruments and trade policy in the implementation, the full implementation of our TSD chapter. And I think that the Korean case is going to be an interesting test case. Kathleen. Well, related to that, uh, to that answer, um, if you look what's happened in Brazil this, uh, this summer, and we had the discussion on that already, um, and the Mercosur agreement, some of the people say that the Mercosur agreement, if it would be in place today, it would safeguard um, the Amazon. I don't think so. Eh? And I think we need pre-ratification conditions on um, Mercosur and other FTAs before we start uh, discussing um, the actual ratification. Would you agree on such an approach? Because that would leave the European Parliament with an extra leverage to make sure that we use trade, for instance, what you mentioned in your introduction, for instance, to make sure that we come up with real engagement um, on, on what has been decided in Paris. So would you agree on this pre-ratification pre approach? As you know, the President Bolsonaro of Brazil had a different policy position before he got elected as President of the Brazil. Now that's, on your, that's not unusual in politics, as I know. Uh, but after he got elected, he decided that he was actually going to take a different approach if there was an agreement with the European Union and the Mercosur countries, and where he decided to move with us in actually becoming part and a signatory of the Paris Agreement. And under the Paris Agreement, under his national determined contributions, he is talking about 12 million hectares of reforestation between now and 2030, zero logging. He is also talking about re uh, better forest management. So if we didn't have trade policy and a trade agreement, we wouldn't be in a position to put some leverage on the Mercosur countries, including Brazil, to be able to deal with these issues. All of us are appalled at what we see in the Amazon. But we don't have the tools at the moment outside of in the European Union to deal with them effectively without actually some leverage through trade policy. And I think that the final ratification stage is where you can actually have a lot of leverage. I am prepared to look at what you mean by pre-ratification, but I just caution you in this, that if you have a pre-ratification uh, a discussion, you're also going to, they're going to ask the European Union to open up other chapters as well. So there's nothing for free when it comes to trade. And now for Renew Europe, it's Karin Karlsbro. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the introduction. Creating a level playing field for all companies, including in developing countries, to compete and grow in the modern global economy must be a central goal for the digital trade agenda. What action will you take to promote an open and fair global digital economy that respects reciprocity, fair competition, transparency and consumer privacy while creating opportunities that benefit both people and businesses in, the, in and outside the EU? And how will you ensure that already existing ex international texts on digital trade, together with upcoming EU rules, create a consistent and coherent international framework for digital trade? And finally, when will the Commission present their digital trade strategy? Thank you. Please. Well, I agree 
Madam Carlsbrough, that, that an open and fair trade must be based on global rules. That's why we're trying to convince the United States that this is the right way to go about it. And I met Roberto Azevedo today, the Director General of the WTO, to discuss these very issues and to see where we can proceed from here. He, is, of course, is expecting the European Union to show more leadership uh, in the future, and we are going to work together with him to see how we can maintain a, an open and fair trade and rules-based approach in a multilateral system like the WTO. So we have, and in this committee has discussed many times, about how we can protect ourselves at the same time with trade defence instruments. So whether it is the very innovative foreign direct investment screening uh, that has been put in place, uh, or whether it is the international procurement instrument that is being discussed at the moment, and I hope that the Council will make some moves in a positive direction on this instrument in the near future. I met Peter Altmaier, the Minister for the Economy, recently from Germany, and I detect a little bit of softening on the German position. Uh, uh, but I, we'll see how far we get, but I think it's a very important instrument. The effects of foreign subsidies on our market, is, of course, is, uh, in the digital area, uh, is very important to us in the European Union. I will be working with Vice President Vestager uh, in order to develop a tool that will address the distortive effects of foreign subsidies in the digital area, especially in our own internal market and how state-owned enterprises in China, for example, are being used for this purpose in the internal market of the European Union. It, you know, we, we are very proud of the fact that we have an open market-based internal market. But sometimes it's abused by some people who, work through foreign subsidies, are, are taking advantage of this. Uh, so we have to be strong in, in our defence at times when we need it. We have 140 trade defence measures, uh, and 93 of them are relating to one country. Uh, and we have over 40 investigations uh, at the moment. So we need these, these instruments, to, and, and we need them to be able to uh, enforce them as well, because if, we, if they haven't the capacity to be enforced, they're not much use. Uh, ultimately towards getting a, de a desired outcome. So the U EU export uh, control system, again, of course, allows us to ensure that some of our sensitive goods and technologies that you've mentioned are not misused in a way that would threaten international security as well, which is another growing issue for trade. Is there a follow-up? <clears throat> Thank you for the answer. Especially with regards to digital issues, we have seen how they have caused significant controversy. In order to ensure a proper debate on these and other provisions that could prove controversial, I would like to ask you how you will further improve involvement of civil society and stakeholders throughout trade negotiations, their implementation, monitoring and evaluation. And how will you improve the communication regarding current and future trade deals so that the benefits of trade becomes known to all? Please. Well, I, I'm, I'm very happy to engage with all civil society stakeholders, members of the parliament, and members of national parliaments in this issue. This is a critically important priority for to create the digital single market. We've been trying to do so for many years, but we are making incremental steps. Uh, but we are conscious of the fact that we need a level playing field. And if we have the necessary level playing field, which we're engaging with China, for example, in the WTO for this purpose, uh, we are hoping that through a finalization of discussions on e-commerce at the WTO that we may make progress uh, in trying to have a, a digital agenda, a digital trade strategy that is actually uh, can be done not just at a European level but of course globally with the rules and the disciplines that are required. So we are open to whatever discussions that are necessary to, f to communicate the benefits of trade. Uh, it's a difficult task sometimes. Uh, so we have to have you know, a lot of engagement to make sure that the right and accurate information about what is in tra trade agreements is put out there, and we need your help to do that. Thanks a lot. And now from the Greens, it's Heidi Hautala. Thank you very much. Um, Commissioner-designate, good evening. Um, I made a small discovery in your written answers. You said that you will want to have a, a, a zero tolerance towards child labour. And uh, I would like to invite you to look at several resolutions by this committee where we call for mandatory due diligence uh, in situations where human rights are breached by European companies uh, or um, uh, deforestation is the topic. And I'm, I'm glad to, to tell you that also the Commission in July decided to call for regulatory and non-regulatory measures uh, towards uh, eliminating uh, deforestation in our value chains. 
Um, so what would your approach be uh, if you were invited to participate in, uh, in an exercise which I th see coming uh, to put in place mandatory due diligence for our supply chains? Madam, Madam Hootler, I, I understand that this committee, uh, in its right of initiative, will be in a position to make some proposals in this regard as well. This is an, uh, the right of initiative is, is something that President van der Leyen has spoken about in our political guidelines and which I support very fully. So I look forward to working with this committee if this becomes a priority for the committee in relation to whatever uh, technical support or reports or hearings that are required to develop the proposal uh, uh, from this committee in relation to due, due diligence. My services will be helpful, uh, hopefully, in this regard, and I'd encourage it. But we can also point to a good track record in, uh, in terms of addressing human rights. Uh, and these, uh, you know, for, ex for instance, the conflict uh, minerals regulation, uh, which will enter into force in 2021, and which can be reviewed again two years later, is an opportunity. We have the timber regulation, which you have mentioned, uh, which is you know, prohibits the placing on the EU market of illegal, illegally harvested timber and, and, and products that are derived from timber. We have measures to ensure access to a remedy for victims. We have the Victims' Rights Directive. And another example, I think we've mentioned it when we spoke, about the Non-Financial Reporting Directive, uh, which where 6,000 of the largest EU companies have, now have to report in respecting due diligence activities. But of course, we, we can do more, I'm sure. But I certainly feel that this is a good starting point uh, where we have made a lot of progress and of course trade policy can do more to leverage on human rights and torture or any other issues, gender equality, these are all important issues that trade can play as part and if you decide to put forward as this part of this committee uh, a right of initiative on this area, I'll be glad, very glad to support it. Follow up, Heidi. Commissioner. Um, I also discovered in your written answers quite many references to the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, and um, I would like to ask you, how do you think the Commission should organize its work around this? Because it's now a part of every Commissioner designates, every Commissioner's uh, mission letter. Do you think it should be uh, the Commission chairperson herself, or uh, how should it be organized? And what would your contribution in concrete terms be? I think this is the opportunity to speak about the Chief Technical Enforcement Officer, the Trade Enforcement Officer that we are, have, have in mind. Uh, and uh, President van der Leyen again in our political guidelines outlined that this was a very important, and my mission letter mentions it. So I, I, I would like to proceed with this work as soon as possible in 2020. Uh, I think we need to engage the committee with myself and uh, with all relevant stakeholders to see what is the criteria in terms of reference that we can put together for the purposes of this particular new position. It should be politically accountable, but also I think it should be at a high level in order to ensure that we have good communication but also good uh, level of enforcement and implementation of the existing agreements. As I mentioned to uh, Madam Van Brent earlier, uh, trade policy and, sustain and, and the TSD chapters they have to go hand in hand. But we need somebody to concentrate full, fully on this particular implementation and therefore I I, I believe that this is a good appointment and a good initiative, and I look forward to discussing that with you. Thanks a lot. It's now for ID, Markus Buchheit. Thank you, Chair. Commissioner Designate, es besteht Konsens, dass wir keinen laissez-faire. We don't want to have any laissez-faire attitude here. If we look back to 2016 and the concerns we saw on the streets about CETA and the TTIP agreement that was discussed at the time as well, I think one of the main critical points there was the situation for our farmers and how it might negatively impact them. It's very important we have consumer protection and uh, security with our food supplies as well. When we look at Mercosur, again, there are concerns. When we look at the figures, we have concerns with regards to the impact assessments as well and the publication of information there. There just isn't any really 
clarity about the consequences, particularly for our agriculture. Mr Hogan, with regards to the Mercosur deal, how are you going to deal with that if the new impact assessment shows that there are real concerns for farmers more than had previously been feared? Well, I very much understand the concerns of agriculture in relation to the deal between the European Union and Mercosur. Uh, when you have to concede uh, certain uh, quantities of product, nobody in the agricultural community could be happy with that. But when you look at the cumulative impact of what we have achieved in the trade arrangements around the world for trade deals, you will see that is a very positive outcome uh, for agriculture overall in relation to CETA, in relation to Japan, in relation to Mexico. We have a, a, a very positive outcome. Mercosur uh, agreement uh, is certainly uh, one where we are going to do a sustainability, a sustainability impact assessment, an economic analysis, and these will all be available, and we're going to do a cumulative impact assessment in 2020 as well to see what are all the trade deals, including Mercosur, meaning for farmers in terms of their business and their, uh, and their vulnerabilities in particular commodity areas. So by keeping tariff rate quotas as low as we possibly could on beef, on sugar, on ethanol, uh, on poultry, uh, I think that we have reached a balanced outcome, uh, of course, that, uh, uh, when we look at all the sectors in relation to what we have achieved in Mercosur. So I hope that these analyses that you are seeking and what we can give you in 2020 and 2021 before we come to the stage of action to having to look at ratification of this agreement, that they will be able to show you uh, that we have reached a reasonable outcome and where many sectors in agriculture have actually positive outcomes as well, like in the area of dairy, skim milk powder, and infant formula, like in the area of wine and olives and other areas, but of course our sensitive sectors where we had to insist on a tariff rate quota with significant safeguards uh, built into those particular uh, quotas where we have a safeguard mechanism for the first time in relation to a tariff rate quota, uh, where if there's a surge of imports into the European market, we can, uh, on the basis of evidence, withdraw that particular uh, TRQ for a period up to four years. These are all safeguards that I think they are there for the first time. Mr. Buchard, and follow up. Yes, just as a follow up. In June of this year, there was a, a billion euros that you promised as aid to our farmers. I wonder uh, where this figure came from. Was it something specific or a hope that something might materialise? Well, I'm surprised that you'd call into question money for farmers. Farmers are very happy to know there's money on the, on the way. If, uh, I, I've never seen them object to it. Uh, but this is a prudent uh, uh, sum of money that's put aside in the event of market imbalance and market disturbance for our farmers, and it was agreed by the President of the Commission, with the Commission at the time, uh, in order to reassure our, 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 our sectors that were engaging in some sectoral issues that were sensitive, like in the agricultural area where we were on the defensive rather than the offensive on this occasion, that these, this particular reassurance on the safeguards, on the quality of the food products that were coming in, as well as on financial support in the event that there was market dis disturbance, is outside the CAP budget. Thanks a lot. Now we switch to the ECR and it's Gerd Bourgeois, please. Thank you, Chair. I'll address you in uh, my mother tongue, Mr. Hogan. Um, uh, Thank you. We believe in free and fair trade and in dialogue and in stability and sustainable growth. And that's the, if you look at the state of the art um, agreements, um, we have to look to the WTO, but we need to protect ourselves against unfair dumping. Um, and we have been accused of a dumping practice overseas. For example, the apple processing um, uh, business, in particular with uh, South Africa. And um, the problem is that we have not been uh, quick enough or automatic enough to resp in our response. And will you take the uh, timely measures uh, to protect uh, whole sectors and people's jobs therein? Thank you. I agree with the, with the general sentiment that you've expressed that we need to be 
faster in relation to our response, and we need to be able to help our small and medium-sized businesses as well to be able to generate the necessary evidence-based proof that is needed in order to generate the safeguards and to help them in the event that there is uh, allegations of, of, of a made against them. Because often small businesses, as you're well aware yourself in your in Flanders, uh, you know, these are particular small companies that cannot, cannot afford to be going to expensive litigation, expensive procedures elsewhere in order to justify uh, the, you know, the, 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 the issue against them. So what we are uh, looking at very intensively in DG Trade, and I've spoken to the officials about this, is how we can uh, get earlier resolutions of the case and how we can do more for small and medium-sized enterprises in terms of giving them help and support and also engaging with member states and regions as well for to see what mechanisms we can work together with rather than duplicate uh, the help we can give in particular focus on small and medium-sized enterprises. So we have, we have identified major deficiencies in, ma in some areas. You are aware of the Colombian situation, the Col Colombian decision imposing anti-dumping duties uh, on, uh, of all things, Belgian frozen fries. So I'm sure that this is a, an issue that you have in mind when you're raising this particular question. Uh, and I, I personally met the Colombian Minister for Foreign Affairs last year to raise this issue and express our concerns, but uh, we haven't really got the satisfactory outcome uh, from the political engagement, so we have to look at other options. Is there a follow-up? Thank you very much. Um, I think that it really is uh, very important to have a timely response. South Africa is definitely um, a case in point. And I think across um, South America, I think there's a job here for the Chief Trade Enforcement Officer. They will no doubt be keeping an eye on the ball and re reacting swiftly. Thank you. I think the Chief Trade Enforcement Officer is going to be very busy, uh, uh, certainly, and uh, I think that's a good thing because otherwise the Commissioner would have to do everything. Uh, but uh, we can work together and work with you in order to make sure that we have the division of work uh, in order to get a good outcome. But just to assure you, uh, Mr. Bourgeois, that the issue that you, I know that you're alluding to in relation to uh, potatoes and Belgian fries, uh, an iconic product in this part of the world, is something that we are dealing with uh, in a very serious way in the Commission. I know that uh, Madam Van Brent is interested in this as well, that we have submitted a request for review of the case to the Colombian authorities. Uh, these efforts have been inconclusive, I said, but the Commission is not standing idly by, and uh, we very quickly now assess and decide on the option of the WTO dispute against Colombia. Thanks a lot, and of course German fries are also concerned. Um, and uh, the last uh, uh, from the coordinators is Helmut Scholz from the GUE. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Hohen, Commissioner Designate here. Uh, probably the whole evening we are speaking about rules, about fair and ethical trade, about uh, the question of principles, of implementation of the fair trade. And you, in your written answer, have referred to the question that you uh, will have to strive to find uh, for the WTO um, a new uh, balance by, con uh, by creating new rules where needed for a level playing field, reforming the dispute settlement mechanism, facilitating the integration of plurilateral work undertaken by interested WTO members. In the UNCTAD Geneva principles for a global Green New Deal, there is demand number one, that the global rules should be calibrated towards the overarching goals of social and economic stability, shared prosperity, and environmental sustainability, and the protection against um, capture of the most powerful um, players. Do you agree that, for example, the due diligence requirements for the supply chain and the garment sector proposed by the uh, European Parliament would be such a tool and such a rule? Good. Principle is clear. Mr. Hogan. Well, as I said in an earlier reply, that I am, if this committee so decides to prioritize this initiative on the due diligence as part of your work program for the future, as part of an initiative taken by the European Parliament under the 
political guidelines from Madam von der Leyen, President-elect, I'd be very happy to engage with you in relation to what the scope of that particular uh, proposal should be, taking into account the experience that we have uh, in some of these areas that are like textiles, where we saw the case uh, in relation to the United States and Guatemala, for example, where it took seven years in order to conclude the case, and it didn't, it didn't go exactly the way we wanted it. So what way we actually approach these matters, I'm open certainly to suggestion, open to your opinions, and working with your committee here in, in various ways to get the best possible outcome, to t and taking account of the experience of others where it hasn't worked exactly the way we intended. Is there a follow-up? It leads us to the question how we are making this binding, how we are making it implementable. And uh, for example, we need also the support from the stakeholders in the economies and of the consumers, because trade is about the way of production, of consumption, and of the way of our life. So how you want to promote, for example, this idea of fair and ethical trade in the public, in the citizen, among the citizens, so do you continue the work on the fair and ethical trade award as it has been started uh, during this legislative period? I would be very happy to support that initiative of fair and ethical trade in the awards that have been done, and uh, I know that Ghent has been the recipient of the award in 2019. Uh, and I'm very happy to support the awards again in 2020 and beyond. So this is a way of showcasing and a good communication about what we can do uh, together in order to, you know, to, to utilize the information that we have in a very practical way at these sort of public events uh, and also hopefully generate the consciousness of the individuals in terms of their purchases uh, and the consumption of these products from various parts of the world. Thanks a lot. So this was a round of the political groups on their most urgent question to Commissioner-designated uh, Phil Hogan. Now we have 18 further speakers in the order of this famous Mr. De Hond. And the first uh, is uh, Jürgen Warborn. Please. Thank you, Chair. Um, my question regards the uh, small and medium-sized enterprises since they really form the backbone of the European economy. The European Union has taken the lead in negotiating uh, new free trade agreements with uh, more partners than any other leading trading blocs. But unfortunately, exporters and importers, and especially the uh, SMEs, they do not use the opportunities that the trade agreements uh, create for them. Only two-thirds of our exporters use the FTAs. So my questions are two. What concrete steps will you take to raise the SME utilit utilization rate uh, of our FTAs? And will you consider pushing for more flexible and simple rules of origin so that our exporters and importers actually use these agreements? Thank you. Well, as, as you've said, we have a significant number of uh, small businesses and they, they generate 80% of our trade in the European Union. 700,000 SMEs, are the figure I have, which export outside the European Union. Uh, and they represent more than one-third of all EU exports and support six million jobs. So what you're asking me is very important for the European economy. So what can we do? Well, we, we have dedicated chapters now in our, in our free trade agreements about the role of small and medium-sized businesses and what directly we can do to help them. We will always ensure in every FTA uh, a dedicated chapter uh, to address specific needs of the small and medium-sized sector. Raising awareness of these agreements with our small and medium-sized sector has been a problem. So between the members, as I said in a reply to a previous answer, between the member states and the parliament and ourselves as public representatives, we have a role to play with the stakeholders in each member state uh, in order to do better in terms of raising awareness and creating new platforms uh, in order to develop specific actions for uh, our uh, small and medium-sized uh, sector. So I am prepared to listen to what is the best practice because the Commission cannot do everything, trade policy can't do everything, but when we get a good agreement with good chapters in SMEs, it's a terrible pity if we can't actually 
get, get our small and medium sized uh, businesses to be able to take advantage of. So rules in our, of origin are an outcome of negotiations between partners who may have diverging interests and approaches and such differences in rules of origin of course are, are sometimes unavoidable but we try to mitigate them as far as possible in agreements. So we will talk about the consistency of rules of origin in different EU FTAs, but there's always a few that will diverge. Follow up. One, one issue that is important to all businesses, but especially for SMEs, is of course uh, bureaucracy. Um, and I know that in your mission letter it says that you should use the principle one in and one out. Uh, so I'd like to ask you, um, how, you uh, how you plan to engage with this uh, princi principle when it comes to, to trade. Uh, President von der Leyen uh, indicated that very uh, significant statement in our political guidelines and uh, I have been asking myself the very same question to know how we could engage in trade with this issue because you don't have that much legislation. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm sure that we'll work together to try and find something to be in the spirit of better regulation or the new political guidelines. Uh, you know, we, we, I'm, t I'm sure that we can find something where we often duplicate uh, in legislation and that perhaps we can look at the administrative burden that causes to small and medium-sized enterprises. Okay. The next is Nicola Danti. Grazie, Presidente. Thank you, Chair. Commissioner, if I may, I'd like to pick up the topic of the WTO. Some topics have already underlined this. Of course, it's a very important uh, and strong uh, political institution and multilateral negotiations have been blocked for years now. In your written responses, you de dedicated significant space to this topic and you also set out clear objectives, a strong initiative um, so that um, we should have responses by 2022. So I'd just like to understand in more detail, you mentioned this in your opening comments, but I'd like to um, have more detail. There were two objectives for the Commission, uh, the social agenda and climate change. So what proposals can you put forward um, in terms of changes to the WTO on these two topics? Well, as I said earlier, we are trying to engage with our like-minded partners to try and ensure that we don't have a crash in relation to the appellate body in, de in December. Uh, we have made suggestions to the United States. We haven't got a response yet. But in particular, uh, the European Union's agenda would be new rules to reinstate a level playing field uh, uh, are required and uh, on the industrial subsidies and on the technological area in particular the rules have to be strengthened uh, in, tr in various three areas in transparency and foreign subsidies uh, on enforced technology transfers and that of course should occupy some of our time in the D in WTO where we're engaging with China in the, in, in the D D WTO on these issues. Secondly it's clear that the, the, the WTO in its present configuration is not working and functioning efficiently and effectively. So I've spoken to uh, Director General Azevedo about that today. He accepts that and we have to work together to try and you know, speed up the, the decision-making process uh, to look at plurilateral approaches rather than multilateral from time to time if, because we don't want to have a situation where we're blocked completely in relation to decision-making. And finally, the, 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 the definition of development status of a, of a country is now under discussion again. Like it is hard to understand that some countries who are designated as development are one of the, some of the powerhouses of the world and they're still designated and defined as devel with development status. So, so long as we have countries that are, that are looking for special and differentiated treatment, it should be on the basis of needs and evidence rather than actually uh, on some of the more powerful economies that we see under that category at the moment. So these are the, ref uh, is the agenda of reforms in the, in the short and medium term that we're willing to pursue at the EU level. Thanks a lot, follow-up. Well, there's another topic, uh, e-commerce and the digital sector. It's already um, been globalised but without rules. It's particularly important for protecting European citizens, particularly when it comes to goods arriving on our territory through the digital market 
or protecting citizens' personal data. I think that within the WTO, we it would also be important to have a clear position on this topic as well. So I'd just like to know what you plan to do to protect European citizens in this important issue of e-commerce. Well, I, there's two objectives. Of course, the personal and private data of the individual has to be protected, but equally we have to open up digital trade to everybody. So these are the, the twin objectives of what we're trying to achieve under the e-commerce negotiations in the WTO. And I am becoming more familiar with the, with the dossier on this uh, because we have submitted revised proposals in recent times to try and unlock uh, the, the potential for this. And uh, the, the, we were expecting that we would make more progress uh, in 2019, uh, but I, I, I would hope that by MC12, by June next year, that we may be able to reach an agreement. We are getting some traction with China and getting some traction uh, with the United States and Japan as well on this particular important file, because these are the, uh, in addition to the European Union, we're the big players in all of this. So we, are, we see this as a very important development in dealing with the industrial subsidies, the forced te technology transfers, the IP theft issues. All of these are hugely important for our companies. And uh, if we want to go forward, uh, with a strong opening and a, and a digital single market and a strong opening for the European businesses on digital trade, we have to have some level playing field and disciplines and, and rules that we all can work with uh, globally. Thanks a lot. Next speaker is Jordi Canas. Gracias, Presidente. Señor Hogan. Thank you very much, Chair. Mr. Hogan. Now, Based on your written answers, you have committed to supporting the Mercosur Agreement. We would like slightly more information on this. This is an agreement that, if it were to be ratified, would offer huge opportunities to some of our industries, our producers. It would help to consolidate the presence of the EU in a region where our competitors are already uh, getting into the markets here. Of course, there are opportunities, but there are also legitimate concerns from certain sectors, farmers, for example, and also concerns from the environmental perspective. When we look at the recent fires in the Amazon, for example, where uh, there would actually be compliance with the environmental chapters. So. What can we do to guarantee that we have a balanced, fair, sustainable agreement with Mercosur that has effective mechanisms in place to ensure environmental commitments, for example, the Paris agreements in particular, also on human rights and labour conditions? Thank you. Well, uh, as I suggested earlier, um, we would have a very weak argument in order to deal with these issues from the point of view of the European Union if we did not have an agreement with Mercosur. Uh, and I understand the sensitivities of the agricultural sector, but uh, in, in the case of your country, uh, as uh, you're strong supporters of a Mercosur agreement with the, United, with the European Union, and, uh, and I think in most sectors, uh, because the benefits in industrial side and the benefits in procurement, the benefits in many of the agricultural areas uh, that affect your country are very positive in terms of trade reductions or trade liberalisation and duty reductions. And at the same time, we, we achieved a significant win in geographical indication protection, uh, which allows our model of uh, rural intellectual property to be able to be disseminated into that region. Sometimes we have enemies uh, uh, you know, uh, that are out there in the, in the, in the marketplace who do not appreciate the European model of rural intellectual property, our geographical indication system, which is a system that means high quality. So I think that we have a lot of positives in the agreement, and we also have to be mindful of our sensitivities, uh, and to, especially in the agricultural sector, and to be able to manage these successfully. Um, the safeguard mechanisms that we've put in place are worth noting, particularly as they affect uh, agriculture, but also the leverage effect that we get from market access for the, the TSD chapter is huge. And to be able to convince the Brazilians to, go, to join us in the Paris Agreement and to sign up to it, means an enormous amount, uh, rather than having another uh, difficult situation where South America and the United States were together, leaving the Paris Agreement. 
So, you know, expecting European Union to be leaders and then having such big entities that are outside the scope of the agreement, I think uh, we can say that this was a very positive outcome in ensuring that the four countries of South America uh, came with the European Union side in relation to this TSD chapter. So, I, you know, of course, there's, there's always a balanced outcome, but I think overall, uh, certainly from the point of view of leverage of market access for the issues that are questioned by you, I think that we have received a good outcome. Follow-up. Well, it's not about uh, convincing those who are already believers, such as myself. We need to have strong arguments to deal with people's reasonable doubts. We have had s concerns recently that certain obligations aren't being complied with because we don't have the right mechanisms in place to safeguard the process. So that's what I think is gener generating the concern. We need to ensure that we can tell European citizens that these commitments will be complied with. Obviously, it's better for us to be there because no agreement at all would be worse, but we need to be able to answer the question to say, what are we going to do to work on these safeguard mechanisms to improve them, to make sure they're effective so we can really convince those people who are yet to be convinced? Well, for example, if uh, any of the countries of Mercosur decided that they were not going to be partners with the European Union in, in uh, being part of the Paris Agreement, will there be no deal? So that's a safeguard that people have in terms of the sustainability agenda. Uh, this is not the ideal one, but nevertheless, it's an option that people have. If we don't see progress in the dialogue that we will have in terms of bringing about ratification of this agreement, you know, member states, regions, members of the European Parliament have an option. And we, keep, we certainly tell our partners in Mercosur that this is the way that the process works. So there's pr huge pressure uh, on the Mercosur side uh, as well in order to ensure uh, that there is a positive outcome to the ratification process. This is where we have some leverage still that we can play with. But the safeguard mechanism, first of all, in agriculture, for our sensitive TRQ products, is the first time that we have a safeguard mechanism. And we have, no, we have a precedent now, because we've used it in relation to rice in Italy and Spain, in relation to Cambodia and Myanmar, where we've used this safeguard mechanism based on the evidence supplied. And you know, we don't have to recreate a precedent. We already know how the system will work and how the evidence can be gathered. So this is one example. We still control the licenses. We control the, quality, the establishments that will be approved for beef, for example, uh, in relation to any product will not come into the European Union without actually meeting EU standards. And there will be 100% checks and controls by member states in respect of those products. So I think we, we have to do better on the communication, I agree, but we will work with each other to try and make sure that we have the accurate information and, the, and good information. Thanks a lot. Next speaker is Anna Michel Azimakopoulou. Chair. Commissioner, your, your mission letter states that um, Europe is at the heart of the rule based multilateral system, and one of your priorities is to lead on the reform of the World Trade Organization, notably in the fields of forced technology transfer and e commerce. So at the same time, though, you're asked to strengthen Europe's leadership in relation to both the United States and to China. So my question is twofold. Firstly, how do you plan to balance these tensions between multilateralism and free trade on the one hand and protective measures alongside other policy instruments in the context of world trade organization reform on the other hand? And secondly, um, how do you plan to involve uh, us here at the Parliament and our committee in your efforts with respect to WTO reform, which is something in your written answers you mention is a priority for you. Thank you. Well, as I said earlier, the WTO is facing its uh, deepest crisis since its creation, uh, and uh, you're well aware of the problems. The dispute settlement mechanism is falling apart. The rulemaking is paralyzed, and transparency is being underused. And uh, Europe will continue to do everything we possibly can at the WTO and to put the WTO at the center of our global trade because we have to protect an, our rules-based multilateral approach. Otherwise, as I said, we'd have the law of the jungle. And in that sense, 
we see that there is a number of issues that we can agree with the United States if they are of a like mind uh, to come with us. But we have no indication whatsoever from the United States that they're willing to work with the European Union or any other partner in order to deal with the reform that's necessary in the WTO. I think the WTO itself realised that they, there is need to be reform. But equally, we have to, we have to, we, the European Union has to stand up for its own values and its own interests, and it has to play from a position of greater strength than we are today. And this is where our trade defence instruments are very important. And uh, the work that you have done in the Parliament uh, to date is very important. You have further work to do, uh, and I will work with you in the Parliament in order to ensure that we have the proper toolbox in place that is able to exercise some leverage in relation to the issues that we have on, uh, to deal with, like forced technology transfer, like IP theft, like state-owned enterprises in China that are being subsidised in order to go into markets like the European Union. Uh, and we have to operate on the basis that we are protecting our European business on one hand, that we have a level playing field, and as an open economy, we want to see others opening up uh, and, and uh, implementing what they said they would do many years ago when they joined the WTO. Um, I, I would just like you to briefly tell us what your position is with respect to the multilateral investment court. This, as you know, is a discussion that's ongoing with the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law. Um, and if you could just kindly touch on that, and what your position and your specific plans are with respect to its establishment. Thank you. In, in, in brief, it, it's, a, it's a very new initiative, as you know, but we are actually in favor of establishing the multilateral courts. Uh, and uh, the necessary work that uh, un is underway in order to bring that about. Uh, but it's, uh, it's early days, as it were. But I think that there is uh, a need for these particular uh, courts to be established uh, in order to give effect to our trade policy. Thanks a lot. Next speaker is Imarie Rodriguez Pinheiro. Senor Comisario. Commissioner, we have talked a lot about the importance uh, that I think we all believe in about having a multilateral trade system based on rules and the reform of the WTO. You have talked about the importance of involving the US and China as well. So bearing this in mind, China has developed a system that allows it to engage in unfair competition, which in part is why we need this reform. How can we ensure that China actually takes on its responsibilities and participates in the reform of the WTO? What we want to do is to be able to strengthen the trade defence instruments in the safeguard clauses. I would like to know more specifically, will you take into account the costs that SMEs incur, such as farmers, to deal with this bureaucratic burden. In your time uh, as the Agriculture Commissioner, you will have learnt more about this, and how will you protect the more sensitive uh, agricultural areas? Well, I, from my engagement uh, with some people already, I think that there is an appetite on many countries to engage in ensuring that the WTO process is maintained. We have worked with Canada in developing a, a new arbitration system, but it will be on a temporary and interim basis. Hopefully more countries will join because you, you need a lot more than two entities and two uh, geographical blocks in order to uh, have a meaningful outcome. Um, I also will take an early opportunity to engage with the United States to see what they actually want, because they have not told us what they want, in spite of the fact that we have been making some proposals to the United States for some months now. Uh, so I know that we were getting into a, a, poli a political season as well in the United States, which may come into effect and into, take into account what the attitude will be. But I do, like in the WTO reform process, we have an engagement with China. We do not have an engagement with the United States presently. And I hope that we will. The costs of the trade defence system, and I, I, I suspect you're, 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 you're thinking about the, uh, per, a certain piece of legislation where it might have a, a, a dramatic impact in terms of costs uh, to small and medium-sized businesses. It depends on where the co-legislators will end up with the threshold in relation to the outcome of that legislation will determine 
um, whether we have you know a heavy burden of costs in small and medium sized enterprises or not so that's a matter that we will engage with as co-legislators in the legislation that's going to trilogues very soon where we can set the threshold at a reasonable level uh, like we costs are hugely important from the point of view of small businesses and how we help them to be able to manage those costs in, term, in taking a case is a big burden on them, I realise that. So therefore the thresholds that we set are important. In your written response on trade strategy, as well as the comments you have made this evening, you haven't specifically mentioned trade and economic uh, uh, relations uh, specifically with Latin America uh, in general. Is this a priority? I'm also somewhat concerned your commitment to involve gender in trade, uh, it doesn't seem very ambitious as far as I can see. There was uh, an event today, there was a commitment from uh, Commissioner Malmström to incorporate this aspect into trade deals to make sure that women would benefit. So I want to know what your commitment is here. We don't have uh, common customs, even though we have common tariffs, because it depends on the port where the products come in, different uh, methods, different paperwork. We have a lot of falsified um, uh, counterfeit products that come in from China, for example, uh, also uh, phytosanitary issues. So how are you going to work together with the uh, commissioners for the internal market to resolve these problems? Well, no, no product under our SPS system comes into the European Union except under the auspices of EU SPS system itself, our regulations. And our member states are the ones responsible for doing the controls and checks on our behalf. And when we had a scandal in Brazil two years ago, three years ago, we immediately had 100% checks and controls in order to deal with this issue. So if there is complaints or if there is evidence of any particular SPS problems, you should report it to your member state, first instance, who are operating under the EU regulation on SPS. And we have very strong chapters on SPS, and it's not negotiable in any of our free trade agreements, our SPS chapter. Everybody has to raise their standards to the EU standards, not the other way around. On gender equality, I'm glad you mentioned Commissioner Malmström's commitment to gender equality because she rightly uh, was able to point to this today at a conference of perhaps maybe you were pre present. And I'm sure that she has an agenda of work for me to do in relation to gender equality, which I'm very happy to, to engage with. The Irish members of the Parliament will tell you here that, uh, you know, that I, I'm, I'm not averse to actually uh, promoting the notion of gender equality when it comes to participation in elections in my own country as Minister for the Environment. I actually introduced the legislation to ensure that more women were able to participate in national politics with some very good results. So you don't have to convince me, I can assure you, in relation to gender, gender issues and gender equality issues. And if we can utilize trade policy for that to achieving those objectives, there's no difficulty. Thanks a lot. Next speaker is Anna Cavazzini. Yeah, good evening, Commissioner Designate. Um, Mr. Hogan, your portfolio covers um, the EU investment protection policy, for which in the mission letter of von der Leyen there was not really specific goals, which uh, is a little bit um, unfortunate. Since in recent years, um, special rights and special courts for foreign investors um, have raised deep concern amongst EU citizens. And also, since um, the projects going on in, in your departments are, are, are manifold, your departments work on the multilateral investment court, on an investment agreement with China, on the reform of the European Energy Charter Treaty. And also, at the same time, court cases against, um, let's say, coal phase-out and fossil fuel phase-out are rising. So my question is, um, do you share my opinion that investment protection rules have a strong impact on how we are able to meet our policy objectives and, first and foremost, the fight against climate change? And if yes, will you ensure that the SDGs and climate imperatives take precedence over investors' rights, especially with a view on the multilateral investment court and the reform of the Energy Charter Treaty. And last question, there is investors' rights, and are you also 
happy and looking forward to engage investor obligations on the other side when it comes to human rights and environmental obligations. Thanks Thank you. Lot. I know I have to bow to your superior knowledge in these matters because I know you were five years as a policy expert for your party. Mm -hmm. So you're going to drill more deeply into the technical issues mm -hmm. than I would be able to do in, in two weeks uh, trying to prepare for these hearings. So allow, notwithstanding that, I am in favour of the establishment of the multi-investor uh, uh, court system. Uh, as I've said earlier, EU investment protection agreements do protect the assets of European companies which have established themselves abroad against a limited set of practices uh, by the host state. Uh, but uh, such investment protection rules uh, are embedded in and observed in the legal systems in the EU and the member states. So they may not always be guaranteed in other jurisdictions, and I think this is the question you're trying to, you're trying to convey to me, uh, the importance of having a safety net uh, for European companies operating in foreign mar markets comes into play. Um, I, I certainly, I, I'm not going to uh, say tonight that I'm a, an expert in legal terms in relation to what you're proposing, but I'm willing to engage with you and engage with the people that have a, an interest in the establishment of these courts in a meaningful way uh, to tease out the implications of what is involved, notwithstanding the principle of what I said that the establishment of these courts are important. Follow up. I have a follow up on a, like, very connected area and um, following up on colleagues questions beforehand i think you have heard in the committee there's a big interest and in, in the trade and sustainable development chapter and in the sdgs and in climate change and um, you mentioned that you will concentrate first and foremost on enforcement and this is of course good but i wonder because as the sdgs are new and you have a specific um, mission also in your mission letter on the sdgs what new proposals do you have to really implement the sdgs and sustainability all over the tra new trade agreements and not only in the trade and sustainable chapter. In trade and sustainable development is hugely important and we have our al already have our international commitments to the Paris Agreement and through various other agreements uh, and uh, through the sustainable development goals. It would be certainly an objective of mine through the WTO process to integrate the sustainable development goals as part of our work, our work program uh, for the WTO and which includes a lot of binding commitments that people have signed up to. Uh, I think also, uh, you know, that following uh, you know, your debate in 2017-2018, you developed a 15-point action plan on the implementation uh, that, uh, on, the, on the TSD chapter, which I would take as an agenda of work that we could implement as well. So we have, we have much we can do, and we have included a lot of binding uh, commitments and dispute resolution settlements within the FTAs that we've done. Uh, but I think that that agenda, either in the WTO or here in the, in the European Parliament, I think if we can implement those particular objectives, we'll make a lot of progress in the next five years. Thanks a lot. Um, next uh, speaker is Marco Campomenosi. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Chairman, welcome, Commissioner. With regard to Airbus and the WTO and the ruling, it's a very delicate topic. And if you have a country which is not part of Airbus, the project, such as Italy, uh, we could be the second worst affected by the application of the new American uh, tariffs in, the, in this um, area. And it's going to affect the agri-food sector, which is completely um, separate from uh, building aeroplanes. And I am uh, wondering, are you going to try to seek a better balance um, in the working out of the, of the ruling you know from your previous experience in agriculture as a commissioner for agriculture that uh, Mercosur, uh, Vietnam, Australia, New Zealand agreements, uh, but also the US, these are trade agreements which are of tremendous um, concern. They're major worries uh, for the, uh, the food sector. Are you going to keep that front and center of your mind? First of all, agriculture is not part of any negotiation with the United States. Secondly, uh, I wish the United States would engage with us because the Airbus has to come into compliance arising from the WTO decision, and they should. And if they would negotiate with us on the basis of what's 
uh, coming down in the future in relation to Boeing, we would not have to impose a retaliatory set of actions. But I do, look, we have to wait to see the extent of what tariffs are going to be imposed by the United States in the first instance, if it's 5 billion, or if it's 10 billion, or 25 billion has been mentioned. So when we see the extent of a course, I will engage with stakeholders in this committee and elsewhere to have a look at what we have to do to stand up for ourselves in the European Union and to be able to deal with it, not just in we have to do so immediately, uh, but we also have to take into account the retaliatory action that we may have in the context of the Boeing decision. So I would, I would, I would ask the United States to negotiate with us rather than actually having a tit-for-tat trade war that only does damage to both economies and both sectors on the civil aviation side. Is there a follow-up? Hubner, Mendelssohn, Ashton, Ferrero Waldner, De Gucht, Malmstrom, Hogan. Sono tutti commissari. The, that was the list of um, uh, commissioners from 2004 until now. All of those countries with different commercial interests, uh, sometimes contradictory vis-à-vis -vis Mediterranean countries. And I think perhaps it's time for a, a new approach and for a major effort on behalf of the uh, Commission to defend um, geographical um, protection methods. Can you provide any guarantee when it comes to designations of origin, etc.? Are you aware of the degree of concern on the part of those who are, who um, there are farmers who feel that those who are looking after their interests come from far away, and um, they are asking, is it really a concern for the commissioner as much as it is for us? First of all, I, I'm not commissioner yet, uh, so Hogan is a bit premature. <laughs> but I have a job to do as Trade Commissioner with your support in defending the EU interests. We are not going to impose tariffs uh, because of the airports. It's the United States are going to impose tariffs. And I hope that the Italian government and all the influence you can bring to bear on your friends in the United States, of which I know you have many, uh, will be able to convince them that an agreed solution with the European Union is the way forward. And we have tables of proposals uh, in July in order to try and reach agreement with the United States in a constructive way. I do understand that there will be countries like the one I know best will have a similar view perhaps as you uh, in Italy, but we have to defend the European Union uh, and uh, certainly uh, we have to stand up for uh, our trading interests overall and uh, even though it might not be in the short term uh, 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 too easy to do so. Thank you. Next uh, speaker is Jan Saradil. Thank you, Chair. Just right behind you, uh, Commissioner Designate. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you very much. Let me turn once again your attention to Asia. Uh, you have described in a, in a very pragmatic and realistic terms our relations with China as uh, a bit imbalanced uh, and far from being perfect. On one hand, it's a great market, great opportunity. On the other hand, we have somehow bumpy relations. We had dispute over so-called market economy status. Uh, uh, we introduced that investment screening procedure. Uh, could you be a bit more specific? Uh, how would you design our own EU autonomous negotiation strategy vis-a-vis -vis China in few concrete steps? Uh, something which really would be uh, uh, EU-owned, not just copy-pasting, for instance, a US position uh, or any other position. Well, as you know, we're in negotiations with Japan, or sorry, with China at the moment in relation to an EU-China investment agreement. And this provides the opportunity and the platform politically to explore all of the issues that have been mentioned already here this evening, including the, some of the con concrete steps that I've mentioned already about state-owned enterprises, about forced technology transfer, about the, the manner in which their economy has not opened up to the extent that it should, as promised. So we are engaging, and I'm asked in my mission statement by President uh, von der Leyen to conclude these negotiations by the end of 2020. So when you look at my mission statement about all I have to do, uh, you know, this is a very uh, major piece of work, and to achieve this outcome will be quite challenging. But we will uh, start 
with the WTO meeting on the 5th of November in Shanghai, of which I will be present, and I will meet all of the various political representatives at the highest level, except uh, President Xi Jinping, uh, in relation to trying advancing a number of areas of importance to the European Union, including the WTO reform, including the issue about completing the, in, the uh, in international investment agreement that we are negotiating by the end of 2020. Follow-up. Thank you. Uh, China also is engaged uh, in many uh, Southeast Asian countries, has very strong links, and uh, therefore many of those countries are tempted to conclude trade deals uh, with us uh, in order to have some geopolitical balance uh, against Chinese influence. What is your perspective of, of that development? How do you see our trade relations, for instance, with ASEAN countries? Would you believe that we should continue our country-by-country country approach, or would you be rather in favor to do something uh, similar to what we did with Mercosur and to try to find out a way to uh, some wider EU-ASEAN trade deal? Well, Commissioner Malmström has made every possible effort to do a region-to-region -region, uh, agreement uh, with the ASEAN region, but various countries have different problems that we cannot uh, actually negotiate with presently. For example, Philippines uh, is not in a position since 2015 to negotiate with us, uh, for issues that are well known to you. Uh, Thailand and uh, Malaysia have some difficulties in relation to the mandate that you have given us to negotiate as well in complying with very important chapters like trade and sustainable development chapters. Uh, but we have done very, very good deals with Vietnam, which you are now, your committee, are engaging in the ratification process. Uh, this is an excellent deal for the European Union, and I hope it will be ratified. Uh, and, of course, clarification on various issues will, uh, are needed, but you will get that clarification, I hope, when you visit Vietnam at the end of uh, October. And also Singapore. We expect that this will be uh, coming into effect uh, in the, uh, by bef between now and the end of this, this year. We have had a number of issues that will be important on geographical indications that we have recently resolved with them. Uh, so hopefully that will come into effect. And of course we have the South Korea uh, deal uh, for, since 2009. So country by country we are making progress. Indonesia has an opportunity, but again there are many issues there. Uh, where we have tabled ambitious proposals on the environment and sustainability there, and we're waiting for responses from Indonesia. So all in all, I don't see progress on a region-to-region -region basis, but I see a lot of progress on, country to, on, country, on a country basis, which we are making some progress along the lines I've just said. Thanks a lot. Next speaker is my good old fellow chair, David McAllister. Thank you, Commissioner Designate. President von der Leyen asks you to strengthen Europe's ability to protect itself from unfair trade practices through, among others, the use of a new system for screening foreign direct investments. Now, this new system only seems to coordinate the national monitoring systems in those 12 member states that actually have a similar screening system. So my question is, do you intend to beef up the mechanism for foreign direct investment screening? The answer to that is yes. Uh, I'd like to see a, a coordinated and harmonized approach for all member states of the European Union. I hope we can achieve that. Uh, there are some concerns in some member states in relation to this, particularly our friends who are in the 17 plus one. Uh, so we have to work together to see can we get an EU position on this um, uh, beefing up uh, uh, this particular screening mechanism, I think, is essential if we want to protect our critical technologies and our cri critical infrastructure. Uh, there, we, we just cannot take a chance on these issues. If we are a very open economy like we are, and the internal market is probably the most open in the world, we expect the same of the people that we're trading with. And, and we have been promised a lot by China. It has not been delivered yet. So let's see what we can do with the investment agreement in order to make better progress. Of course, there are other instruments as well that we're adding to that, the, the, the one of in, in the international procurement uh, instrument, which, of course, you're very familiar with and which is going through the committee at the moment. A follow-up? 
Thank you, Commissioner Designate. Global public procurement markets are characterized by strong imbalances. While the European public procurement market is open for third country bidders, as you pointed out, EU bidders face even higher obstacles in third country markets. There is a legislative proposal made by the European Commission on the new international procurement instrument. How will you move this forward? I'm glad to say I started uh, in the last few days to engage with uh, Mr. Altmaier, the German Minister of the Economy, I will be hopefully over the coming weeks in the, in the event that I'm ratified, if that happens, that I can engage further in the coming weeks with uh, France and other member states to see what are the issues that are blocking an, an agreement and how we can make progress. I think there is a, a growing awareness now in the Council uh, and the Economic Councils that the importance of having strong trade defence instruments is very important in order to help us negotiate some of the issues that we want to negotiate with where we have difficulties. And uh, I think we operating from a position of strength gives us a better leverage effect, in my view. Thanks a lot. Next speaker is Marie-Pierre Vidren. Monsieur le Commissaire Désigné, vous Commissioner Designate, you talked about our trade policy being based on reciprocity and fair trade rules to guarantee Europeans, European interests. Around half of public procurement markets around the world are closed due to protectionist measures. How specifically will you help to move forward the public procurement res legislation? What new legislative proposals will you make to defend multilateralism and the key role of the European Union and how we can respect our trade policy and its implementation, particularly on sustainable development. We have talked about having a chief trade enforcement officer. That's going in the right direction, but I'd like to hear a bit more details about this. Do you have some candidates for this position already? What kind of resources will they have? How exactly will they work with your office and our institution? Thank you. Well, of course, if you want to uh, reform the way we have a, an open rules-based multilateral approach, we have to start with the, the body that is at the centre of adjudicating on all of these rules and the, uh, implementing the disciplines on behalf of all of the participant countries, and that's the World Trade Organization. I've explained uh, some of the ideas uh, to Mr. Dante earlier on in relation to how I see this uh, being, uh, seeing this happening. Uh, but in the absence of getting a, a support from the United States for to do this, we have to have a plan B, and we're working on this, and we will table proposals and take leadership in the European Union in the second half of 2020, and we will get an opportunity to discuss them with this committee about what we will do in order to ensure that we have a rules-based dispute settlement process in place uh, at the end of 2020, hopefully. And uh, I've already mentioned as well the issues of trade defence instruments. You've mentioned the public procurement one. I want to advance this, and I hope that the Council will see the benefit of having strong uh, trade defence instruments as part of the leverage effect in relation to how we can actually negotiate with countries that are not uh, exactly playing by the rules in relation to foreign subsidies and in relation to uh, forced technology transfers and the theft of IP. Um, the Chief Trade uh, Enforcement Officer is a very important initiative. Uh, I think your country is very familiar with this concept and has promoted it very strongly. Uh, and I see this as a, as a, as a Deputy Director General st status in the Department of Trade, uh, and that it would have terms of reference that would actually uh, make it, give it some teeth in relation to uh, the position, uh, and also that it is able to you know, ensure it has the re that, the, that the Department of Trade is restructured in such a way that it is able to facilitate this appointment in a meaningful way and to be able to give it the necessary resources, human and otherwise, to be able to do the job effectively and well. It's not going to be a standalone agency, but it's going to be politically accountable to all the institutions of the European Union. But hopefully, we'll make it as effective as we possibly can. Our European producers and consumers want us in our trade negotiations to prioritize environmental and health concerns, amongst others. So I'd really like to hear more about specific proposals, actions that you will take to ensure that products which are imported into the European market truly respect our standards. Thank you. Well, the best example I can give you is some products that have been subject to fraud in recent times or in the organic sector, for example. Some years ago we had fraud and we reformed the organics legislation with the help of 
uh, rapporteur Martin Housling in the, uh, in the, uh, in the Agriculture and, and Rural Development Committee. I worked very closely with him, and we achieved a good outcome in relation to standardization and harmonization of the rules for our producers of organic produce, both inside the European Union and indeed to have similar standards and similar rules for those who want to uh, import uh, from outside into the European Union, export to the European Union. So, secondly, our chapters on SPS, particularly in recent agreements, have been very solid, very ambitious, and we expect all of our importing countries to be able to ra raise their standards to the European Union standards. This may be important in future agreements as well, perhaps in the context of an agreement and a negotiation we'll be doing with the United Kingdom. If we don't have standards uh, across the board in relation to agriculture or industrial products that are very high, well then we will allow a situation to arise where other countries will be able to put cheap products, cheap food products in per perhaps in particular, into our neighboring jurisdictions uh, that will displace uh, products in the European Union. This will be very unfair to our producers and we have to guard against this. Thanks a lot. Um, next speaker is Tiziana Begin. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to the Commissioner-designate. I'd like to go back to the sustainable impact assessments. The previous Commissioner didn't treat these as a priority, even though it is clearly important to evaluate the environmental and social impact of I would just like to ask whether you will take a commitment to carry out these studies and publish them before um, negotiations begin for trade agreements. We do uh, carry out uh, impact assessments before trade uh, negotiations begin now. Uh, we, we do an incept, uh, uh, inception stage in relation to uh, sustainability and uh, market opportunities. Uh, we, I think already you see the, uh, this uh, inception agreement already published this year in relation to some agreements we've recently concluded. The sustainability impact assessment uh, will be published uh, before ratification, probably in about a the end of next year. We will have a publication of a sustainability impact assessment in relation to uh, uh, Mercosur. We'll have an economic analysis done. We'll have a cumulative impact assessment done. Uh, and then we have an ex-ante assessment done uh, to see what the impact of trade agreements and what they are having on each of the sectors. And we're doing that for some of the agreements that were completed uh, you know, th three, four years ago and which are being implemented for a number of years. So I don't think we're short on assessments. Uh, and I think I'd be very happy to publish them. Well, thank you for your answer. I didn't mean before ratification, I meant before negotiations. In some cases, it would have been helpful. For example, if we were to start negotiations with countries that are um, currently suspected um, uh, of uh, using uh, child labor, for instance. However, I would like to raise a different issue. on the safeguard clause on imports from Cambodia. Cambodia, however, has argued based on union interests. And I'd just like to ask you, what is your understanding of union interests? Do you think it's necessary to have uh, a definition to ensure that we can act when one single member state is at risk? Well, I'm not a legal person, so the definition of union interests, I, I'm not able to help you there, but all I do know is the practical reality of the safeguard mechanism for uh, the everything but arms deal that was done some years ago, where Cambodia and Myanmar were in very much involved in rice production and the export of rice to, to the European Union. Uh, and we found uh, over a period of time the necessary evidence from our countries like Italy and Spain, particularly Italy, uh, that there was a surge in imports uh, from Cambodia of rice uh, to that particular country over a short period of time. And we took action. It took some time, maybe a bit longer than it should, but we got there and we invoked for the first time uh, a safeguard mechanism in favour of Italian and Spanish producers in order to protect 
uh, their particular uh, business interests and agricultural interests in line with what we had agreed. Uh, and we, uh, we would, this creates a precedent now that can be utilised uh, a safeguard mechanism for other uh, products. Now, up to now, it was always products that were the subject of liberalisation uh, in relation to a free trade agreement. But now we are in a position where we have a precedent in relation to tariff rate quotas for sensitive products. So we will continue to monitor all of the various imports around the world that we have free trade agreements with. And, and I think the Cambodian example of where we have acted uh, in order to protect the rice producers of Italy and Spain in respect of Cambodia and My Myanmar is a good precedent. Thanks a lot. Next speaker is Joachim Schuster. Thank you very much. Um, Commissioner um, von der Leyen has talked about the uh, carbon um, um, border adjustment tax. And uh, this is intended to provide a level playing field for European uh, manufacturers. But there are big uh, decisions coming up the next few months, a legal base. Is it going to be mainly environment or mainly commercial? It could be a tax, and that would, of course, require unanimity in council, which is a, a, a disadvantage, as opposed to a qualified majority, and it depends on the legal base. The, it all depends how it's calculated and how it ties in with the ETS, uh, which is very important because it's got to be WTO compliant. And is there a link um, between the value of the, the product and the environmental damage? Can those two things be quantified? I'm interested in your own um, plans for the border adjustment, the, the carbon border adjustment tax. Do you have plans in that area? Well, it's a very complex issue, and I'm very happy that the lead commissioner on this is going to be Commissioner Gentiloni. Uh, because uh, he is going to be the one responsible for doing all of the due diligence in relation to this matter, the impact assessments, uh, because it's quite a complex issue, as you've just described. Uh, and uh, you know, the objective is to avoid carbon leakage and ensure carbon companies can operate on a level playing field. Uh, uh, combining this tax with free allocations in the EU emissions trading scheme, uh, because with free allocations there's no cost to be adjusted, uh, so I, I think that this, uh, this uh, approach, of course, we have to be working as well with Commissioner Timmermans, who will uh, be the Commissioner, the Vice President, uh, the Executive Vice President in charge of, of climate matters, so G DG Klima will have a role. So the trade policy in terms of how it, it becomes involved uh, is certainly something that I will have to tease out and work closely with, with, with Mr. Timmermans and Mr. Gentiloni. I do not have, obviously, I have had no meetings about this yet. I'm not going to assume... Uh, the position of Commissioner until I am, but I think that we will have to uh, see what the options are very closely because we don't want to have a situation where we're doing everything that we should be doing and our competitors around the world are doing nothing. Uh, so how do we manage this relationship and not put by having a good outcome uh, and at the same time uh, our people around the world doing absolutely nothing on the same agenda, which puts us at a competitive disadvantage. So these are issues we have to tease out very closely in an impact assessment. Follow up. Thank you. It's not, uh, it's not entirely satisfactory. Um, one of the questions I was asking was, how do you ensure WTO compliance? Um, there's a whole question of the STDs, the sustainability chapter. You mentioned uh, South Korea, which is a good example. That is an area where there was a very progressive um, sustainability chapter, but it's been seven years. It's been a little bit ignored, and I don't think anything has really changed. There's been discussion, but not much has changed in the real world. And my question is you. Were you to become the um, responsible commissioner, how are you going to enforce uh, that, for example, respect for trade union rights, which is not the case and is clearly, blatantly not the case in South Korea? Well, we, it's precisely that for that reason that we have in the agreement with South Korea a dispute settlement, a dispute settlement mechanism which we are now involved with. 
for the first time in a free trade agreement, we had this particular provision in the 2009 agreement. It's now been invoked by the European Union after several efforts to have a, an action plan to ensure that South Korea honoured its commitments in each chapter. So we are taking the next step, which is a, a dispute uh, a settlement mechanism, which is in line with what was agreed in the, in the, in, in the agreement. Now, you're asking me to make it a, to give you prescribed and prescriptive outcomes in relation to something that I have absolutely no idea yet about how we're going to construct it. And it's not my direct responsibility. And I would be very happy to engage with you here when I have more information from the lead commissioner, led by Vice President Timmermans, about how we're going to, how we're going to go about this. I'm, not, I'm, a, I'm in favour of, of course, the provision, as outlined in my mission letter, to, to play my part. Uh, but I'm sorry I can't give you more satisfaction in the detail, but you can't expect me at the same time to be able to give you exact details for something that we haven't even started the process. There are many complex issues, you know that already. And I do too. Thanks a lot. Uh, next speaker, Stanuta Maria Hübner. Uh, Bern, I, uh, Commissioner, I would like to ask you about Brexit. I know it's, it's not an issue where, where you feel comfortable because it's all about speculation, but I think we can safely say that both if we have an exit of the, on the basis of no deal or if we have an exit in an orderly manner, this will not be final destination and probably immediately we will start the negotiation of the future arrangements, future relationship, and certainly an FTA will be the, the core of this future uh, relationship agreement. And in this context, uh, I, I know that it will be our British friends who will decide what type of FTA they want, and we know that Mrs. May was in favour of very ambitious, very deep, very solid, and broad, uh, and, and with uh, level playing fields measures, and that the current government is r rather showing interest in something more shallow and more conventional, and not really very, uh, we don't see commitment to level playing field. And um, I, I also think that taking into account the size and proximity of this market, I, I think any any FTA will have to be in function of guarantees on, on standard. And in this context, actually, my, my question is how, how you see this, uh, this issue of the L, 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 um, level playing field measures as a sort of uh, red lines uh, for, for us, and also especially if we take into account the, the temptation on the British side to go to move toward um, regulatory divergence rather than convergence. It's very hard to know what direction the United Kingdom are going at the moment because they can't seem to get a deal through the House of Commons and they've tried three times, as you know, the existing withdrawal agreement. Again, as you rightly point out, Prime Minister May and the European Union had a very good agreement and a very balanced agreement and it certainly uh, reassured the European Union in relation to level playing field on state aids, on standards, on environment, on labour rights uh, and all of the food quality, all of those standards consumer protection, all of those issues are very important to us and they will play a part in the mandate, I presume, that ultimately that I will be charged with responsibility uh, in negotiating this particular agreement. So the European Parliament and the European Council, I'm sure, will have a lot to say about the mandate that will be given to the Commissioner for Trade in order to negotiate and I'm sure the level playing field will be high in your minds. No follow-up. Um. Next speaker is Emmanuel Morel. Bonsoir, Monsieur Le. Good evening, Commissioner Designate. The uh, reform of the WTO is a really pressing concern. You've talked about uh, state subsidies, the dispute uh, resolution mechanism. You talked about the US. Uh, you've alluded to intellectual property as well. Mrs. Uh, von der Leyen actually doesn't mention this in her mission uh, letter. But really, this is counterfeit, uh, akin to counterfeit. It's a real disaster for Europe. We're seeing SMEs which are being sacrificed. We're talking about 400,000 uh, jobs and around 85 billion euros. It affects particularly France, Germany and Italy. We're talking about textile, furniture, um, medicines. Now, as this doesn't feature in Mrs. von der Leyen's document, is this a commission priority? Is this something you're going to discuss with the China? You talk about uh, negotiations. Well, a huge amount of the counterfeit is coming from China. 
And then what do we do with these types of online platforms like Alibaba or Amazon who are selling these counterfeit products and Europe's doing actually absolutely nothing? Well, first of all, we're strengthening our trade defence measures in order to be helped to concentrate the mind of the Chinese authorities in relation to these matters. Secondly, we have an engagement with the Chinese at WTO level. It's not going very far at the moment. Thirdly, we are negotiating with China an, investor, uh, an investment agreement where all of these issues are on the table. So it is a priority for me and a priority for the Commission that we, in the context of concluding an investment agreement by the end of 2020, that we include the issues very much that you have mentioned, Mr. Ma Mr. Manuel. So this is important for me and I will be following up very closely with all of these issues that you've mentioned in the context of an invest investor agreement with China. And I'm charged with responsibility in my mission letter, by the way, uh, by the end of 2020 to have this job done. L'Europe se comportera de façon un peu moins naïve que... Well, I hope Europe will be a bit less naïve than it's been up to now. Now, coming back to the WT and this idea of working on the reforms in June of last year, uh, the US, Brazil, Australia, Mercosur, they attacked us as Europeans. They complained with regards to the precautionary pr principle, which is a very important principle for us as Europeans. So I'd like to have your views on this subject. Your colleague, Mr. Sefkovic, uh, your prospective future colleague, who said you have to boost uh, the culture of evidence-based uh, policy. Uh, precautionary principle, however, is based on scientific doubts or concerns. So will you defend this principle that we think is fundamental, so the precautionary principle when it comes to agriculture in free trade agreements? Well, I've already demonstrated that this year by the agreement we had in Mercosur, where we insisted on the precautionary principle being included in, it, in that agreement. And I can tell you they were very unwilling to do so, particularly in Brazil. Uh, and we eventually persuaded them to do so because it was becoming a red line issue uh, for the European side. And there would have been no agreement, in my view, without including this provision in that agricultural part of the agreement, as well as all aspects of the agreement with Mercosur. So I'm giving you a personal example of being involved in a negotiation already this year where we were able to achieve this outcome. Thanks a lot. Next speaker is Jude kirten -Dalek. Thanks very much, Chair and Commissioner. Um, I'm tempted to ask you a question about Brexit, but I'm going to resist. Um, and I'd like to squeeze a bit more detail out of you, if I may. Um, the EU's GSP system is the most generous in the world and has helped to bring about prosperity in numerous countries and regions. However, the system also has numerous shortcomings, as we've already heard about our TSD chapters. Partners such as Myanmar and Cambodia have severely and systematically allowed human rights violations to take place and flouted international conventions. GSP Plus recipient, the Philippines, has gone as far as to openly mock the European Union. But in spite of this, the system has been slow or incapable of reacting just as we've heard as our trade and sustainable development chapters inside FTAs. So I'd like to ask you, could you give us a number, preferably five, of concrete actions that you as the commissioner responsible will undertake to improve the implementation of GSP and TSD chapters to ensure that they really fulfill their objectives? Thank you. First of all, we will establish the trade enforcement uh, officer, which will uh, dedicate that person towards implementation and enforcement of these agreements uh, across the board. Uh, we also will take, secondly, complaints uh, from civil society, which we've seen in Peru, which we're pursuing at the moment on the TSD chapter, arising from a complaint, to this, and we have an action plan in place, which they have agreed to do, which is progress, and it shows you that we have through the name and shame mis methodology, perhaps, or through the reputational damage to do a country when they are accused of not honouring their agreements, that we can make progress as well. Uh, um, thirdly, we, we have to engage civil society in these countries more, and we are putting financial resources into helping civil society and structures and NGOs to be able to do so. Fourthly, we will have a, a monitoring system for our GSP to ensure that there is responsible investments in these countries, not 
dumping, uh, as we often accuse others. Uh, and uh, certainly, I, I, I feel that the that the local, the, the labour and environment and uh, um, parts of the agreement, we, again, I hope that they can be prioritised to ensure that the GSP plus uh, uh, countries will be able to ensure and give us reassurance on a constant monitoring basis that they're actually implementing what they said they would do. Uh, we are very much keen to do the reform based on the evaluation that was carried out in 2018 by your committee and by the, the European Commission with your, and, and the Parliament together and that provides another agenda of work for us in order to implement in the coming years to make it better. Thanks very much. Um, just to pick up on um, a number of points uh, that you've raised then, um, what we've seen um, over the last five years is that basically the carrot is wielded, but the stick is very rarely um, used in relation to GSP, and particularly in places that there are serious and systematic violations. Um, would, uh, just leading from your response to my first question, would one area that you would be willing to look into in significant detail be investor obligations? We hear lots about investor rights, the creation of multilateral investment courts, a reformed ISDS system. But would you as Commissioner take up the really crucial debate about investor obligations so that we ensure that European companies investing elsewhere in the world maintain proper standards throughout their supply chains and respect human rights um, in every place that they operate. We're already doing this uh, through our public programmes, through the European Investment Bank funded programmes and through the various EU programmes. I'm familiar with this from my, uh, in my time as Agricultural Commissioner, uh, where we are in Africa, for example, uh, we were often criticised for not doing more in terms of ensuring that we have responsible investments in various countries in Africa. So we engage with the African Union and we now reached an agreement whereby uh, we have a, a, a good understanding about what its other role is. So it's political leadership and policy priorities from the African side and it's technical assistance and financial support from the European Union side. But it's done in a sustainable and responsible way and we're proofing all of the various public programmes through this process. Of course, under corporate social responsibility, the private sector has to do the same. And we have to engage further in this and use our trade policy and trade opportunities with the private sector uh, to do what you're advocating to do in terms of responsible investments and responsible investor obligations. Thanks a lot. Next speaker is Reinhard Bütikova. Good evening, Commissioner. I would like to address an issue that was first raised here by Mrs. van Bremt. The urgency of confronting the climate crisis makes it incumbent upon us to also use trade agreements in order to enforce climate imperatives. All your mission letter says in that regard is that there shall be sustainable development chapters, full stop. That's extremely lame. You said that you take the, these chapters as important. But show us your ambition, please. Are they good enough as they are? How will you propose to strengthen them? What are you prepared to do to make environmental and labor standards in FTAs effectively enforceable? First of all, I would like to see our international conventions and our international agreements being enshrined in our free trade agreements and to be able to be ab or on a multilateral or bilateral basis to be able to be enforced through the disciplines that we put in those agreements for the sustainable development chapters. I'm not sure which of the countries you have in mind in relation to the labor conventions because we've made a lot of progress e even, with a, even with Vietnam for example where under the eight conventions so, you know, we're making a, a significant amount of progress even before ratification of the deal in order to implement some of the, the, the labor conventions. Uh, we have in the Mercosur deal, Paraguay, Uruguay and Argentina have implemented all of the labor uh, conventions. Brazil has, has one more to go out of the eight. Uh, so if there's a specific issue that you have in mind, but my ambition is to integrate as far as we can and with the 
with, the, with as much political muscles, muscle that we can enshrine, and probably with the approval of, your, of this parliament and, and this committee in terms of a, a mandate for future negotiation, the values of the European Union in relation to whether they're economic or whether they're environmental or social. Commissioner, you just mentioned uh, China, and um, I read uh, from your mission letter that you're supposed to pursue the aim of reaching an agreement by the end of 2020. Now, that is not the same as pursuing the, um, the uh, finalization of an agreement under any circumstances. I think we should agree that substance goes over speed. My question regarding the Chief Enforcement Officer is the following. Will you be willing to pledge that this Chief Enforcement Officer will, on a regular basis, not just consult with business, but also with trade unions and civil society actors and consumer protecting actors, and will this Chief Enforcement Officer be willing to pick up trade complaints that are advanced by these actors? I will certainly give you all the undertakings you need towards the widest, widest possible engagement with all stakeholders. Uh, trade is not just... Trade is a very important economic instrument, but it leverages a lot of other important environmental important uh, actions that we want to integrate into those agreements as part of our other public goods policies uh, uh, that are very familiar to you. So uh, you have my undertaking that we will consult all stakeholders, including this parliament, and including this committee, including the council. This person is going to be busy. It's going to have an all-encompassing role for implementation and enforcement. And uh, I'm not going to give any commitment in relation to channeling complaints that that person becomes another ombudsman. I want to see what the resources will be required for this. I want to see what the structure would be, because it's not going to have the same resources that will duplicate a European Union ombudsman or a particular complaints procedure. But I'm willing to discuss what you have in mind in relation to maybe a more a focused approach towards those complaints, because we have, as I gave an example under Peru, by uh, complaints from civil society, uh, that we were able to trigger off an engagement there to have an action plan that was able to implement the sustainable development chapter of our agreement there. Uh, so a complaints procedure will have to be teased out in terms of what's the definition of complaint. We don't want to duplicate with other agencies. Thanks a lot. And the next speaker is Zamira Rafaela. Mr. Hogan, over the last years, the European Union has uh, concluded a number of economic partnership agreements with African regions and countries. For different reasons, two regional ones are currently stuck, whereas the Eastern and Southern Africa Economic Partnership Agreement will be updated into a broader agreement that will also contain sustainability standards. How will you ensure that the post-Cotonou agreement, post-Cotonou trade relationship between the EU and Africa will be values-based, in line with the EU's sustainable development agenda, and will be more equal? So do you agree that EPA should be upgraded in that sense to guarantee more equality, like gender equality, uh, and sustainability standards? And can you also explain to us what you think the meaning of more equality in this specific context is? Context is? Well, as you know, President-elect uh, von der Leyen called for a comprehensive strategy for Africa in our political guidelines, and this strategy will encompass the SDGs, and as such will by its very nature be values-based, including the gender issue, of course, as part of the SDG process. Uh, I have already done a lot of work in this space, for example, through our EPAs and by our support of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement implementation, uh, where we're providing technical assistance to the African Union and Madam Sacco, who is my equivalent in agriculture, will vouch for that. The current post-Cotonou negotiations that you've mentioned, these are aimed at strengthening the partnership with Africa in the same direction, uh, including in aspects related to sustainable development, governance, and common values. Now, in Eastern Africa in particular, they have been very slow about getting off the ground, but 
I think tomorrow is going to be a new day in relation to our engagement with Eastern Africa in terms of in, uh, developing a new EPA and perhaps we can upgrade this to an FTA which would include all of the issues that you've mentioned including gender equality and EPA doesn't always include those even though they should uh, but if, if it means upgrading our EPAs to uh, upgrading to, the, to, the, to the, the, the normal now of trade and sustainability uh, development provisions, I'd be ha very happy to do so. Thank you for your answer. Um, I just want to go a bit further on trade and gender. So trade is one of the EU, EU success stories, uh, like using trade for other goals. And besides sustainability and social standards, the pursuit of gender equality should also be part of our values-based approach in trade. Today, current uh, Commissioner Malmström hosted a Trade for Her conference, and she has taken this issue very seriously uh, during her mandate. What are you ready to do in order to ensure the involvement of women in international trade, so their social and economic position and rights are protected and improved? And will you follow in Commissioner Malmström's footsteps by aiming to include gender provisions in future agreements? Will that be a yes or a no? I will build on Mrs. Malmström's great success in relation to the gender equality agenda. As I said in one of my written uh, questions, I, I intend in terms of policy development to uh, instruct my services to consider gender impact, imp, gender impact when policy initiatives uh, are, are, are initiated in the future. And I, I, know, I know that Mrs. Malmström had a very successful conference today because I was fully briefed on it. Uh, and uh, as, as, as she and my Director General said at the conference today, there's a strong economic rationale for women's empowerment and economic empowerment as well. And there was an estimate in that conference speech of Mrs. Malmström today, Mrs. Malmström today that it could uh, add up to $28 trillion to global GDP by 2025 if we empower women. Though now even the economic actors can't actually uh, you know, go against this high possibility. But gender equality, the empowerment of women, of course, will be involved in any of FDA negotiations. And our last speaker is Julio Winkler. Thank you very much, uh, dear uh, Commissioner-designate. Uh, I don't know if I'm mistaking, but I have the feeling that the elephant in your mission letter is still China. We have discussed about several elephants, we could call them, but I think China is the elephant in, the, in, in, in your mission letter. And uh, by, by one hand, we have, uh, we have this uh, absence of level playing field. Companies are, uh, European companies are uh, giving us very clear signals about, about this. We, have, we see the market distorting practices uh, uh, in the entire bilateral relationship. By the other hand, we would like very much to improve the prospects of the EU-China Comprehensive Agreement uh, to see the finalize the finalizing of the GI's agreement and and many other objectives this m seem a little bit controversial so how will be your political approach in which manner do you think you can approach this very 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 difficult task and who will be in the von der Leyen Commission who will be your partners in approaching China I would say everybody in the Commission from the president-elect down will be involved in our approach with China uh, but I am reporting uh, on this issue to the Vice President uh, for Economic Development, uh, Commissioner Valdis Tranbrovskis. But of course, I also have a, a close relationship on the trade and sustainability chapters and then the, the environment and climate chapters with uh, Vice President Timmermans. And I'm equally uh, obliged in my mission letter, as you know, for, to engage with Vice President Vestiger in relation to digital trade. So I have to talk to everybody. And uh, I'm sure that Mrs. van der Leyen will be asking me regularly uh, to know what progress I'm making or otherwise with China in relation to the ambitious goal and ambitious deadline that you've set for the end of 2020. But I'm going to start on the 5th of November. It will be my first visit to any country outside the EU in China. And I'm going to start with the WTO ministerial where I hopefully will engage uh, with the Chinese on the basis of how we can agree an agenda. This is an opportunity with the changing of a commission, of course, which always happens every five years to to look at how we can reset agendas or to look at uh, you know, different sets of priorities. But I think Commissioner Malmström and I uh, will continue with the strategy with, in respect of China, uh, which is to have strong 
tools at our disposal within the European Union to be able to deal with the unfair trading practices and to be able to ensure that we have a level playing field as far as possible. Uh, but equally then, we have to acknowledge that there is business to be done in China. Uh, and the business that we have to do, we have to ensure that when they say they're going to open their markets, that they actually do so. This has not been the case up to now. Uh, and we have to see through this investment agreement how we can have milestones and targets along the way that they will be able to meet on this occasion because they have, the Chinese have been the biggest beneficiaries of membership of the WTO in terms of the rules-based multilateral approach in terms of the huge growth in their, in their economic output and their economic activity. Uh, and therefore, it, it has a value to them. So hopefully that we can leverage this value uh, to reaching some common sense agreement between the EU and, and China in many issues between now and the end of 2020. Thank you very much, Commissioner Designate, for this, uh, for this answer. And uh, since I have the privilege of the, not the last word, but the last question, uh, as a member of this committee, uh, let me ask you something about agriculture, because many of colleagues have been discussing about agriculture, and uh, uh, some of the issues are uh, very, very uh, clearly uh, uh, important. There is a link between and the, and the cooperation between agriculture and trade, so uh, it is something that's very close to your heart and your activity in this moment. But uh, we, uh, I think we should speak not only about the challenges for, agri for, the, for farmers, uh, which are coming with the FTAs, but also let's speak a little bit about uh, with the, the opportunities, the enormous opportunities that are coming for farmers, for agri-food producers, for the whole industry, uh, through the uh, free trade agreements of the European Union. And my question would be, Commissioner, what will you do as a Commissioner for Trade to help farmers take better advantage of uh, 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 European Union's free trade agreements? Mr. Winkler, as you know well, farmers do not actually tell you about the good news when it comes to agreements. They never tell you good news. And as a, as a farmer's son myself, and I know there's farmers in the audience, I think that they will share that opinion. So I think that farmers always try to keep the best kept secret, and the agribusiness community are no different in terms of the potential that's there. We have negotiated in, with Japan, probably the, most, the, the biggest trade deal ever, but the most ambitious in relation to agriculture in terms of opportunities. We have 98% liberalization of all tariff lines. Uh, we have huge opportunities in Canada. We have huge opportunities in Mexico. So various regions of the European Union, of course, will target various uh, free trade agreements from time to time, depending on their strengths uh, of, uh, and the, the, their level of interest in particular commodities or particular products. But for every one billion we export, we generate about 16 to 20,000 jobs. This is important for our rural areas. So we have a vested interest in the European Union in implementation and enforcement of free trade agreements. And I think in an economic sense as well as an environmental sense and in, in terms of a social sense. So we have, in agriculture, of course, we, have, we put money behind this in terms of there's 200 million euro for our agribusiness community in 2020 for promoting these trade agreements and bringing their businesses. And when we had a crisis in the dairy sector in 2015, I led, since then, 12 trade missions around the world where we had 60, 70 companies with me on all occasions from all of your member states in order to help sell European high quality. And my advice to the farming community and the agribusiness, quality is very important. And if you reduce quality, you will reduce the potential for the growing middle class population, particularly in, 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 in Asia, for to purchase our high quality products. Sustainability has to be the heart of what we do in terms of producing and processing. This is what the market is looking for. So it will be very short term thinking. Uh, by our farming community and our agribusiness if we do not embrace environmental sustainability and, in, and quality at all times in terms of the way that we want to uh, sell our products abroad. Uh, and uh, I, I, hope, I hope that uh, as Trade Commissioner that I will have a, an Agricultural Commissioner that we can work closely with in a more integrated way uh, in order to ensure that we maximise the implementation and maximise the enforcement of the agreements we have today and that will be to the benefit of our farmers. Thanks a lot, uh, Commissioner Designate, for the answer. Of course, thanks a lot to the colleagues for the question. And, uh, Commissioner Designate, it's clear that it's really the heart of democracy on trade policy here in this room. And uh, all hot topics were covered, I guess. 
And this makes also clear, Commissioner-designate, that the times where trade policy was made behind closed door is really, really over, and we need transparency in formulating trade policy. Commissioner Desenek, now you have the chance to sign up the discussion and make some closing remarks. Well, uh, honorable chair and honorable members, first of all, can I thank you for the courtesy you have shown me tonight, uh, uh, and thank you for your very succinct questions. I hope I have answered them to the best of my ability. I know that some of you may feel that I was a little bit short, uh, uh, because in two weeks I try to drill into the main policy and political issues on a general basis, but I promise to make it up to you if I'm approved in terms of drilling into the technical details in more uh, detail in, in, the, in, the, in the coming time. But I, f I fundamentally believe that trade uh, is important, uh, our trade is fundamental to the human condition. Uh, trade goes back to the Stone Age. Uh, evidence has been found that even before hunters and gatherers uh, settled down to farm the land, the humans exchanged items to which they'd be added value by hard work and skill. So trading is about pride and about optimism. It's about exploration, risk and innovation. But above all, it's about trust. And in our time, that means articulated trust. And trust that takes pen in hand and says, these and these are the rules by which we will operate that these and these are the methods we'll use to monitor in order to guarantee compliance. And that's how the European Union and the community has built its reputation as a trusted and responsible trader. Because we've always seen trading as a, as a partnership where each side is clear on what's going on. And long before environmentalism was cool, the European Union was committed to the environment. And it sought in its trading policies to influence production right back to the handful of seeds going into the ground. Our priority is and will be uh, continuing to base our policies around sustainability. Europe wants the best outcome for all rather than the defeat of some. And all member states, all non-member non states, and indeed all former member states feel the same. Although of necessity, European Union policies must be crafted on a massive scale they seek never, ever to lose sight of the individual. And this is where communication is very important in the future, and dialogue. The European project, Mr. Chairman, was born out of chaos and destruction. Standing amid the shards of their lives, Europeans imagined something better, and they set out to make it happen. They aimed at the impossible goals, and in many cases they reached it. Often, and this must be stressed, often through trade. Yes, laws are passed and actions of the European courts have been key to improving the lives of Europeans over the decades. But trade has had just as big an impact and may have even a bigger impact in the future. How we trade is what matters. How we trade testifies to who we are and to our values and beliefs. How we trade has an enormous and massive and long-term impact on the wider world, as we know from this discussion this evening. So the European Union will need to be a stronger global actor and we need to strengthen Europe's global leadership in trade. Every aspect of EU trade policy should demonstrate, locally and globally, the scale of our commitment to peace, to prosperity and to ending environmental despoliation. That's what I passionately believe and I hope that you can trust me as Trade Commissioner to demonstrate that belief actively each and every day. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Commissioner-designate. Um, now it's up to the political groups to elevate uh, the hearing of today. And therefore, the political groups have a chance of half an hour and half past sharp. We will meet here in Kamawa to discuss the result of the hearing. Half past sharp here in the room in Kamawa to discuss the result of the hearing. Thanks a lot.